Welcome to the 72nd episode of the Flipped Learning Network podcast. I'm your host, Troy Cockrum. Uh, joining me again today is, our, is my co-host, Joan Brown, and then also joining us is J.D. Ferries rowe uh, J.D., can you tell us about yourself? Uh, I'm the head geek at Burbuck Jesuit Preparatory School, which is a uh, BYOT high school in Indianapolis, Indiana, and... Um, I coach, debate, and read comic books and other geeky things. <laughs> um, and so I was thinking today, because I'm here in Indianapolis as well, and so JD knows we've got a lot of snow and have been uh, had a couple of snow days here. Um, and so I was thinking about sending home uh, some sort of assignment or some sort of video to get the students to... to at least be somewhat productive so that we're not as far behind when we come back. And so I was thinking about the whole debate of over should we assign homework, should we give homework, what kind of homework should we give if we do give homework and things like that. And JD, I know, uh, what is your stance on homework? You know, it's changed a lot over the last couple of years. When I first started flipping my classroom, I thought I had discovered the kind of the, the perfect uh, balance of homework because it wasn't, you know, this rote answering questions or anything like that. I got to do a lot of my pre-election activities through the through the flipped videos, and then I started doing fewer and fewer flipped videos um, as I realized that I could do a lot of stuff in class. And so I went through a phase where I was just like, you know what, we don't need to have any homework. Um, and so where kind of where I'm at now is. I don't think I have the ability to do the entire class. I teach a digital citizenship class. I can't do the entire thing um, just in class time, but the types of homework that I like to do in the class um, is to use our Google Plus community, give them opportunities to reflect or opportunities to um, brainstorm or work on projects together, and then kind of watch the homework discussion flow as students are asking questions of other students and answering those questions. So that's where I'm at right now, and I'll see where I, what I've changed and what I've modified next semester. And, and I, I like the concept of not being able to give any homework. Um, the majority of my homework is to be prepared for class as opposed to uh, a lot of teachers, I think, give it as either practice or assessment after the lesson. Mm -hmm. I traditionally try to give it as reading or a video or something they can do to come prepared to class so that then class time is more effective. Um, I would love to, to not give any homework at all, um, but my class periods are very short and I haven't been able to figure out how to not assign things that they they may have to do outside of class. Now occasionally I have some kids that can do everything in class. Sure. Um, and I have some kids who try to do everything in class but cannot finish everything. But isn't that, uh, that's kind of like where we're at with um, as we're discovering more and more about student processing time too and the way that students process information and that different students process information in different ways. So like the big thing for me is not, I think I could cover all the content in the class period. But to give them time to think about it and to process the information that they're getting, to figure out how it relates to what they already know, to figure out how to make it part of their life, um, I think takes time out of class. And I think in a, in a world that offers a lot more entertainment than my classroom, um, giving homework can provide that opportunity to say, we do want you to take some time to process this information from this class. Um, and so that's where I, I, I used to feel like, you know, as, m as many demands as these kids have, let's try and take away as much homework as possible so that they can, you know, have a life and be teenagers and, and have fun with friends. But I think there is a legitimate argument to say they need to have that time to process information um, that they're learning in class as well. I was uh, prepping for this particular discussion, and uh, I did a little looking into the research, and it looks to me like... For high school students, given homework that is about an hour, hour and a half a night, you'll see anywhere from a 10 to 12 percent gain on their understanding. But as you bring it down to the younger kids, it gets less and less effective to the point at the elementary level, 
there's is negligible whether or not it's even effective at all. Yeah. So that's a discussion right there. But I've always wondered, is that simply time on task that we're looking at? Is it just a mathematical formula? The more time on task, the more retention you get. And it's not, and you know, I'm starting to think now, I, we had a, so one of our first flipped classroom teachers was an e economics teacher. And he said that it really changed for him because he would do a 10 minute video showing how to solve a problem and kind of the steps and then say, and I want you to read and it'll take you about 10 minutes to read. So he gave them 20 minutes of work. And he said, I used to give problems that I would think the problems would take about an hour. The kids told me, well, if we really wanted to do the homework, we would spend about an hour and a half. But none of us ever spent an hour and a half. Really, none of us ever spent an hour. We got done what we could get done in about, oh, 20 minutes. And then we would give up knowing that you would help us the next day. And so, you know, he said, so I either give them 20 minutes of stuff that is useful and effective and helps move the class forward, or I give them an hour's worth of homework that they only spend 20 minutes on. And so the kids are going to, in some ways, determine what their time on task is, whether we think that's the appropriate amount of time on task or not. And so, you know, then we get into the discussion of what is valuable homework and how do we help kids see the value in their homework. That's a big discussion. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know that when teachers come out of university, they have any idea what is valuable homework. Um, but, I, but I watch, you know, you were talking about elementary school kids, and I watch my nine-year-old. Um, she's, in, she's in what I lovingly refer to as the world's worst iPad rollout ever. And, <laughs> you know, I watch her do three different web-based math applications that have no tie-in, no infrastructure, no connective tissue whatsoever. And she just logs in and does this rote work, and the second she can be distracted by anything, she is happy to be distracted by it. Well, yeah. Well, that's the old school of just putting a student on a computer with a game that, you know, throws them problems or whatever and rings a bell when they get it right. You know, that's a Exactly. That's a fairly old school method. But um, if you if you want to think in terms of the parent perspective, um, <laughs> I can bring that one in as well. <laughs> I mean, I am the mother of four and it is at times very frustrating to try to fit in all the activities that I would like to do with my children or the ones that they already have scheduled. And it's, I'm not the only person who has said, you know, what are the schools doing with our kids for six <laughs> hours? Why can't they get them taught? Why are they bringing all this home? And so, you know, I'm sure there's other parents that have said that. And we do need to kind of start thinking in those terms, particularly when we have a real problem with health and fitness Mm -hmm. And these kids need time to be outside and play and run. And we're having a real deficit of the arts in the schools. And when else are they going to have time to partake in music or theater or art except at after school time? So all of this kind of builds in to our discussion of homework and what is appropriate and how much we should be giving anyway. I did, a, I did a survey as part of an accreditation study. Um, this was at a school I was at a, almost 10 years ago. But we asked teachers a series of questions, but my two favorite questions were, um, how much homework do you think is appropriate to give a high school student at night? And, you know, overall, and then how much homework do you assign at night? And the, the average answer for the amount of homework per night for a high school student was about two, two and a half hours, and the average teacher in an eight period high school um, gave 45 to 45 minutes to an hour's worth of homework. <laughs> so we were looking at, you know, on average six hours of homework a night in a school that believed that two and a half hours was, was appropriate. So we started delving deeper into this and doing group discussions about it, and to a teacher, the answer came back, well, yeah, no other teacher needs to give as much homework as I do for my <laughs> subject. Well, and I, and I did the math today. I was thinking about this uh, previously. Um, it's kind of a devil's advocate because, you know, um, in, in the elementary, the, the student will spend the majority of their day with the same teacher, but in middle school and high school, they won't. And so I did the math. I see my students for three hours a week 
And if if we're generous and say, since we're a small school, I'll see him passing in the hallways, or I might have a um, a study hall with him or something. So let's be generous and say I spend three and a half hours with him a week. That's two percent of their week that I spend with them. So how how effective can you be if you're only spending two percent of their week with them? So, it's just something to think about um, as far as the, the argument that some parents will say, they spend so much time with you, why can't you accomplish this at school? And I say, they spend so much time at home, why can't you accomplish this at home? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean if, you fi if you factor out how much now, of course, a, a certain amount of time is allotted for sleeping, but the parents see them a significantly more amount of time than the actual teacher does. See, and I think the 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 flip side of that is, you know, speaking as the teacher, but also as the parent, because my my wife and I talk about this all the time, because we're both working professionals, mm -hmm. and so we drop our kids off for, you know, um, my youngest has a before care, and so we drop her off at the before care. And then they go to school all day, and then after school, they're both, they're, all three of my kids are in aftercare. And so when I pick them up between 5 and 6 p.m., the parenting clock starts. And so then we're eating dinner, and we try to eat dinner as a family. And so we try to prepare dinner as a family, but if the kids have homework, they're doing their homework while, we're, while the adults prepare dinner. And then you eat dinner as a family, and when you're done, if they still have an hour of homework or an hour and a half of homework then now it's bedtime because they're supposed to get eight hours of sleep a night. And so the entire parent bonding time with their child is 45 minutes at the dinner table and helping them with their homework if they need it. And you just feel like miserable parents. Like you just <laughs> sit there the whole time going, shouldn't we be having fun? What happened to game night? And, you know, it, as we've watched, as I've watched my children struggle because of the iPadification of school or whatever, um, we do, you know, we've stopped watching TV in the evening so that we're spending more time focused on homework. But, you know, as a result of that, the whole family is in a room that is quiet, that has fewer distractions. And while everybody's doing something, we're not doing it together. But at least the TV's not on. So we, you know, take comfort in that. <laughs> but I think you're, I think what we're, I, I don't know, it sounds like there is a social, like a society wide discussion that needs to happen about what homework is and why we assign it and why we do it. Um, my math teachers will tell me again and again that a student doesn't learn a mathematical concept until they have done 50 problems on it. That, that 50 is their magic number for most students to get to, to understand the type of problem that they're working on. Now they don't mind doing 50 problems in class or 50 problems as homework, but they know the kids need to do about 50 problems. And they're my experts, so I'm going to believe them that these kids need to do that type of work. But then where is the best place for that to work to happen, and how do we do it efficiently in a world where we also want the kids to exercise and we also want them to be involved in community activities and we want them to go to church and we want them to do all these other things? Um, that's a much wider issue than the individual teacher saying, in order for me to cover all of the common core-based objectives on this list, I need you to do this many minutes of homework a night. Well, I'm going to maybe come back and ask the math teacher, is, is that to master a particular equation so they can perform well on a standardized test, or is that a lifelong logic problem that they could apply elsewhere my teacher will swear to you it is a lifelong endeavor. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Just a mess. <laughs> I will say we, we, we are generally not Common Core obsessed, so we can, we can usually knock that out. But no, my teachers will absolutely say this is lifelong endeavors. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that's where we're running into the, the biggest problem yeah. is that the, the teachers really feel that pressure to, to get those scores on those tests, and they're using the homework as the repetition in order to jam that information in. And as we all know, um, that's really not going to lead to anything down the road. We need them to, to be able to think and to, to come up with some creativity along the way as well. 
or on the flip side, they're using that as the enrichment because they're using the, you know, they have to do lexiles and they have to do acuity and they have to do pre pre test for the post assessment <laughs> pre test. And and in order to do all of that, they still want to read of mice and men. And so in order to read of mice and men, you've got to read that at home. And then we'll we'll try and free up enough time in our testing regimen that we can watch the movie in class and discuss it. But if you're going to read it, you got to read it at home. And that's where you know making that choice of what do we sacrifice and what do we give up, and we're being told by the powers that be that they're the things that we cannot give up are test prep and standardized tests. Mm-hmm. Well, I, and since you brought up the reading, that's one piece I really struggle with is sending kids home to read frees up a lot of time in my class to do activities. But if they're not understand the understanding what they've read, right. then I need them to do the reading in class. And a lot of kids, at least from my experience, are not uh, do not have the experience to read in class and to critically ask questions and to use the teacher as a resource while they're reading in class. Um, and so that's that's a balance that I try to find is how how much reading should I expect them to do out of class and how much reading do I have them do in class when they have my supervision um, and, and it's a difficult balance to find because I can do a lot more engaging activities if they've done the reading in advance but then the students who don't understand the reading really don't gain a lot from the activity anyways because they still haven't got the basic content that they need so so are you finding benefit in giving kids checks on their reading, like doing an online quiz that does a check to see if they read it? I, I go back and forth on this because the when I give them when I give my freshmen critical reading, they can answer the rote questions. They can answer, you know, that this author gave this statistic, can you pair it back to me what that statistic was? They know how to find that. But when I ask them deeper questions or I ask them to infer meaning or I ask them to um, decide what their position is and argue with the writer of the paper if they disagree with them, then they're almost incapable of it. And so that becomes, okay, this is something we have to teach over the course of a semester how to do. Um, so I, I hear we have a lot of discussion in our school about the, the benefits of close reading and how to encourage close reading as opposed to just skimming over the thing for the quick answers. Right. But that's a technique that I don't think you can learn just by assigning reading at home, and I haven't found the magic homework assignment that allows me to know that they are doing close reading and not doing, I need to get this answered before my basketball practice begins. And that is a struggle that I, I see as well. Um, I have them do supervised close reading on shorter texts, like like a magazine article or something like that, um, where I can teach them the skills to close read, um, and then I, they when they read at home, usually it's a novel or something that they're reading. Um, I don't. I don't do any kind of checking. I don't do any formal assessment of their close reading. I just look to see that they have maybe post-it notes stuck in their book, um, or when we do discussions, are they are they quickly referring back to the information, or are they just expecting me to ask surface-level factual questions and. and I'll tell you, one of the resistance that I'm getting is from parents. Parents would love for me to send home worksheets that just say, what's the author's name? You know, because yeah. they, they can, then they know that, well, yeah, my son did the work. They, they got the right answers. They should get 100%. Instead, and I'm saying, no, I'm, I'm, I, I want your kid to go beyond that. Um, I, I want your son or daughter to read. Very and, and get some more understanding, and I'm assessing for understanding and critical thinking and connections they're making, and not basic factual information. Can I ask English teachers a question? Sure. Since I'm not one, um, <laughs> have you explored audiobooks? 
Have you considered those at all? Uh, yes and no. Um, I encourage students um, to use them uh, as long as they're reading along with the book. Um, however, I just know from my personal experience, if I if I put a a book on you know CD while I'm driving in the car, it I, I could go for an hour and have not comprehended a word that I was hearing, you know, and I, I'm afraid some kids will take audiobooks and not follow along with the reading, and then they're not, they're just, they're too passive at that point. I want them to be active readers, I don't want them to be passive. Um, so the lower level readers, I think the audiobooks help them see how, you know, sometimes they've heard a word a hundred times but they didn't know how it was spelled because they've never seen the word and heard it at the same time. Okay. Um, so I think in that regards it's, it's helpful. Um, but, but I think it slows down your reading process quite a bit mm -hmm. um, and you can become very passive if you're not careful. So... Audiobooks. It, go ahead. Go ahead. Audiobooks is one of the um, options that we have. We have a digital distraction unit where we try to get kids to comprehend how, to, how easily it is to distract the brain. And we use audiobooks as one of our examples. So we'll, we'll have kids take an audiobook of something that they're reading usually for class, but it doesn't have to be for class. And then we ask them to do their chores while listening to the audiobook. And to rate what they remember and what they don't remember from the story while they're doing their chores. And then we have them do the same thing while reading a website. Um, and, and so to build up that capacity that, you know, if you're doing rote routine chores, if you're driving that road that you always drive every single day, your comprehension level on an audiobook is not that bad because you've got your active your active thinking working on one section and your, your rote memorization, your routine thinking is doing whatever the other thing is you're doing. But the second you're trying to read a website while listening to an audiobook, both of the both of the activities are using your active memory and they just cannot do it. And trying to get kids to realize that, you know, they're responsible for their own distracted behavior, audiobooks really come in handy for that. Um, I've seen some of the same thing. We, um, especially our kids with learning disabilities um, who have a propensity to be audio, um, to, to tune in on audio, really benefit from having a, especially a narrator, not a computer voice, read along while they're reading. Um, and the fact that they can control the pacing of the reading now with like Audible, you can control and you can make them read faster or slower really seems to help those kids. I think I was, I was uh, reflecting back on Troy not knowing or, or having trouble getting the students to read something and I was trying to come up with an electronic way to track that and I know at least with a YouTube you could, if someone was reading a book aloud, you could actually see the students, how, where they, they ended in the video and so forth. So I was wondering if there was any, any way to do that with reading. I mean, I suppose there is, or maybe the capability is there, and we just don't have it set up, but so you're, even you're a digital getting, book. I know you're getting closer. I work with, um, our book jobber is MBS Books, mm -hmm. and they bought, um, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but they bought an ebook company, and their ebook platform that they've been rolling out for the last couple of years um, gives teachers that ability to, to, you know, drill down as the buzzword of the day, um, to see which kid spent how many minutes on a screen um, that had this text on it. You know, you're not seeing, you know, it's not to the point that is really scary, which is they've got the video camera on, so they're watching if the kid's eyes are scrolling across the screen. No. You know, that'll be at um, ISTE <laughs> next year because um, it was a Blackboard world last year. Um, but, but that's, you know, those are the types of things that I think are going to be offered as the solution. I don't know if they are the solution. Because I no. think that most teachers get more out of a conversation with a student in terms of did the student understand, did they do the work, where, what is their next step, than seeing a data on a page that says, I spent 6.3 seconds staring at my computer screen. <laughs> or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Just left it on. Um, 
isn't that kind of our segue when we talk about discussion? <laughs> Well, yeah, I just wanted to add uh, two things to that before we get on to what 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 kind of homework is valuable. Um, I did have I assign articles of the week through Google Docs, um, and I had one student who his reflections and his uh, annotations were very showed very poor effort, um, and kept working with him, working with him, explaining to him, directing him to, to questions he could be asking himself and things like that. And um, he, his, he kept telling his mother he didn't understand what he was supposed to be doing in the document. Um, and I showed her all the information I've shared with her or with him, um, some websites I directed them to, and it just kind of gave him some ideas of what I was looking for. But since it was since he was doing it in Google Docs, I went ahead and looked at his revision history. And the the biggest thing we found out was he was reading a two page article and writing a page reflection and adding his annotations in about eleven minutes. <laughs> and so I said maybe if he spends a little bit more time on the article and I looked at some of the other students and I said the other students are spending in the neighborhood of 30 minutes to do this assignment and uh, so the, that ended up being the biggest thing is once he slowed down and we had him start doing it on paper so he wouldn't have the distraction of everything else on the computer his, his work got better um, so that is, I guess, one way to monitor the amount of time spent reading mm -hmm. is I was able to look at the revision history in Google Docs and say, okay, he opened the document. He didn't make any changes for about four or five minutes, so that he was probably reading it at that point, and then he started making changes, and he made changes for about seven minutes, and then he was finished. So, right. um, so that's one thing. As far as reading out loud... Um, a tool that I love that I've recommended. You know, I was talking to our first grade teacher earlier in the year, and she calls every student at home and has them read to her out loud. Um, and I said, y you've got 25 students. How th th it must take forever to call each student, make sure they're home, and then have them read to you out loud. I said, why don't you just set up a Google Voice number, have them call the Google Voice number when, when they're, you know, tell their parents how to do it, have them call and read a voice message to you and then you can listen to them back all at once and save yourself a lot of time so I know a lot of teachers who do things like that so that's another way at least for the younger grades to use technology to hear them reading out loud without having to actually physically be there with them when they're reading out loud. So. Our world language teachers have started doing that too as so we've been trying to figure out what a cloud-based world language lab would be like and that became one of the huge ones was a student being able to take any device they have, um, joys of being BYOT, and you know their day one assignment is to record their introduction of who they are and introduce themselves to the teacher in English just to make sure they've got the technical proficiencies down so that then the teacher can start assigning, I need you to do this audio-based activity and you're going to record it and you're going to throw it into the Google Drive and I'm going to watch it and then I'm going to give you voice feedback on it um, and it's worked out great for them, and they've, you know, basically eliminated the traditional language lab from the curriculum and are going to these cloud-based or online solutions that really take voice and take audio and take video and displace it in time um, and make it more effective as, uh, as, you know, that's the type of homework that can be really effective in terms of allowing the teacher to spend some one-on-one -on -one time listening to every single student rather than take that time out of the classroom. Just an add-on to that, uh, Vokaru is an online audio recorder where you don't need a login. And um, we have some World Languages teachers that they have a, a Google form out there that um, has their video embedded in it of the question or, or the scenario, and then the student has to vocally respond. And they put the link from Vokaru into the Google form. So the teacher just has this beautiful spreadsheet. They can click down each one and listen and makes it very quick and easy. Well, and with uh, what well, we know about Google Translate on, on devices, but 
now Google Glass has has where a translator where you can just look at a street sign or or a menu or something and it'll translate it right there in front of you. So why do we even need foreign language instruction at all anymore? Uh oh, foreign language. Yeah, I mean, like some of my trustees now try. <laughs> Um, so what type of, we've kind of alluded to some, but what type of homework is valuable? What, what do we want them doing when they're at home that we think does have value? Well, um, I, like I said, I was doing my homework <laughs> before this show, and I looked into um, an article about uh, different types of, I don't really want to call it group work, but different types of, of collaborative activities. And one of the big ones is group discussion. And they actually are advocating for very informal, out-of-class study groups that this has shown to be very effective. Um, and it encourages all kinds of, of good uh, peer uh, discussion as well as habits on how to discuss and collaborate with others. Um, and so I know we were talking before the show on how we would accomplish that as as a way or means to homework. I, uh, I spend a lot of my time trying to figure out how to keep my nine-year-old from playing um, stupid video games on her, <laughs> on her Chromebook. And I came down one evening and the TV was off and it was homework time and I saw that she had her headphones on and she had her mic on and I was about ready to just rail into her and then I started listening to what she was saying and she was explaining to one of her friends on a Google Hangout how to solve a problem. And then I started watching, and I realized there were five kids in this Google Hangout, and they were all working up, you know, they were working on their math problems, and they were solving these math problems in this natural and organic way where different kids, and these are nine-year-olds, were taking different leadership opportunities because they understood or they knew they were doing question and answer activities that, you know, you would dream of having on your collaboration worksheet as you were checking off what skills they had developed. Um, and then the conversation deteriorated, and they were talking about music, and they were talking about boys, and then they came back around and started working on English together. And I watched over the course of an hour and a half these five nine-year-old girls using Google Hangouts as their collaboration space in the same way that I used study tables 20 years ago. And that was one of those wake-up moments for me of, okay, it's not all video games, and they are figuring out how to use this technology to their best advantage. Well, I think for me, some of, some of the best learning I see is when we're having discussions or collaborative activities in class and kids are making connections and building off of each other. And I'm always looking for ways to inspire them to do that outside of class and make it easy for them to connect. Um, and I think for years a lot of people thought blogs were the answer, but a lot of my students don't see blogs as interactivity um, and I think now that we're having like hangouts with more video options we're finding more and more ways that students can be engaged and form those collaborative environments to continue what may have started in class or what may continue in class the next day. So as I had mentioned um, the original intent, I remember when Google Hangouts first came out, they were advertising that you could watch a video on YouTube together. And so here we are talking about flipped learning and that many times is talking about a video outside of class. Should we go ahead and promote that for students to say, hey, why don't you get together as a group and watch this? You pick the time and you spend the time discussing it while it's going on and see what, what everyone learns from that. Troy, why don't you queue up what did the fox say right now? <laughs> I did that through. as a group view. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it can only be watched as a group. <laughs> well, I, have I, have. Make, I have to make a confession about something, too, since we're talking about group discussion and more organic kind of things. Um, about two years ago, uh, we did a STEM project, and the instructions were out there as a Google Doc, and this was back before anyone really knew anything about Google Docs, but I knew that there was a chat feature in there and most of the students knew about it as well. And I decided I would just leave my computer open to the chat in, all night just to see what was going on. 
there were students in there saying, hey, do you understand this line? Do you understand what we're supposed to do here? They were talking back and forth about it. All very natural. Nothing was inappropriate. They were on task. And I have always thought back to that and said, you know, this is where it needs to be. We're just not allowing it. We're almost like saying you shouldn't be doing that, where in fact, no, they really should be. They should be asking each other questions. Well, and that be that becomes a where having we have an ongoing discussion at our school about collaboration versus cheating. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, it, it it sounds strange when you put them in the, those you know those stark of terms, but this you know there there is a huge difference between you know kids working collaboratively on their homework together and getting help from another student who doesn't understand a concept from a student who does understand a concept and a student taking the worksheet from their partner and copying the answers and the work down in the quickest rote fashion possible so that they can both have the completed assignment five minutes before they walk into class and I think that becomes the frustration of some of our teachers because they see you know they see collaboration you know in its starkest form as this you know this vehicle for cheating and then you have the other end of the spectrum with teachers saying no we need to give the kids as much tools as many tools as we can throw at them to make them able to talk and chat and share and show videos as much as possible um, I was you know actually taken aback a little by some of my teachers this evening um, we've had we were supposed to have been in school for two days now we have a two-hour delay tomorrow, and I think a bunch of my teachers kind of hit their boiling point of, look, i got to get the new semester started. And so one of the AP U.S. History teachers just posted and said, this is the reading for the chapter that we should have been doing over the last two days, and he posted the, the assignment to Instagram and immediately had 30 kids having discussions on the comment thread of the Instagram of, I don't have my book with me. Has anyone scanned these pages? Does anyone have the login that I can get so I can get this copy of this book so I can start reading? And they were problem solving on their own over an Instagram thread. Um, saw the same <laughs> thing on Twitter as kids were throwing out, you know, a teacher said, here's the overview of next semester if you guys want to read what the big picture of what we're going to try and accomplish this next semester was. And immediately had students commenting and saying, hey, this is great. I wish we had had this over break so I could have been thinking about it more than in the next 12 hours. I think they were being a little facetious, but you know, it was amazing to watch how kids will leverage social media if the teachers kind of you know, point the way. I honestly think the kids are probably leveraging the social media anyway. We had that similar discussion with um, some of my eighth graders right before break. Is that they had to present their twenty percent projects, and one of the students emailed me about three days before a presentation and said, "I, I won't be able to finish my project, um, so I'm going to make it a smaller project." And, and I was fine with that because that's the point of the project is to learn and not to have the final product but I emailed her back and said don't give up yet I'm gonna show you how to finish this tomorrow and so what we did in class I just said in in school we tell you when you ask for help you're cheating but in real life as an adult if I can't finish something I go find somebody who can help me finish it and so I just said what make a list of what you need to do and let's ask everybody in the class who can help you finish this and and so just in a short time she was able to find some materials she needed and somebody who could do one of the things that she couldn't do and she was able to finish her project and, and the dis you know we had a discussion about how this is in real life how you get things done unfortunately in school a lot of times we tell you that's cheating <laughs> so so can we structure it for them? How about uh, Google Plus? The teacher could make study groups and uh, share out those circles, teacher being one of them in the circle, but not necessarily a, a participant, just a, just a watching, and, and you know, kind of make that happen for them, give them that tool, and then kind of watch, sit back and watch. Are they using it? Are they not? And I like Google Plus. Unfortunately, Google does not want to tie Google Plus in with education, uh, and so 
there's sort of a leap. Um, high schools can use it much easier than middle schools yeah. can, and and obviously elementary schools can't use it at all because none of their students are 13. Um, and, and I would love, because I love the interactive features and, and the different ways you can use Google+, Plus. Um, it seems like Google's made a conscious effort to not merge that with any of the educational products. Yeah, I'm, I'll be interested to see how that how that um, evolves over time because I see Google more and more um, based on a couple of its acquisitions, based on some of its talent hunting that it's doing. I think they're moving in that LMS direction, and I can't imagine that they wouldn't leverage one of their most popular features if they decided to go for a full LMS solution. But I think it's going to be a matter of getting educators who are enamored or active in the Google community to start showing, look at all the ways that we can use this, and if you're going to move in this direction, let's move it in the right direction. Plus, they've just got that 13 age limit on it that they've got to figure out what to do with. Right. You know, they're doing it because they want to avoid the legal the legal ramifications of, of SIPA and COPA, but um, eventually they're going to have to reconcile that somehow. But all of them are. I mean, we've got eight-year-olds on Instagram who aren't supposed to be there either, so... Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, I hope I don't uh, spoil anything. I have a Googler who is willing to come on the podcast but hasn't got approval from Google's PR department to talk about certain things that we would like him to talk about. So <laughs> um, I I'm working hard on getting that. He's working hard on getting permission on what he can and can't talk about. Um, hopefully I'm not... Hopefully I'm not blowing smoke and never get him on, but that's I would love to talk about some of the things that we know that Googlers are using right now that are going to hit the market soon. Um, so. You can't just say unnamed source. You can't do that. <laughs> Come on, Troy. <laughs> we, could, uh, we could just uh, disguise his voice and... Uh, <laughs> Blur them out. <laughs> but we you know that Google would just go to the NSA and get the metadata and find <laughs> out who he is. So. <laughs> um, so we can start to wrap it up, but I wanted to, I'm sitting there thinking about Hangouts and um, different uses. And um, I know JD has glass, and I have glass. And Joan and I did a Hangout just to test it out uh, well, maybe two weeks ago. I did a hangout from my glass just to see what it was like, and of course, Joan could only see what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, I thought, you know, how could this be of use? W what could you use a hangout where, instead of seeing you, you're seeing what you see? And I'm going to give credit to Mark Siegel. He just told me about this today. He's out in uh, New Jersey, and he just got glass as well. He's a chemistry teacher, and he has a student that, because of a medical um, procedure, can't come into school, and so she's getting behind on a lot of things. And he did a lab and had another student wear the glass, and then the student at home watched the lab and took notes on the lab and did the observations and everything that, that all the other students in class did. And then so now that's one less thing she has to get caught up on when she comes back. And so I thought that was a, a brilliant use of the Hangout using glass. Another, uh, another live time use that I've found um, that I really enjoy doing, and I started doing this in um, like presentations for other teachers and then started doing it in class because it works so perfectly, is all of those moments as a teacher where you want to share what other students are doing, and there's no easy way to do it because the easy way to share what the other students are doing, you know, it doesn't exist. You either say, everybody stop what you're doing and come gather around this one table where you, nobody has a good view, and it's going to be awkward and unnatural, and it changes the dynamic of the entire classroom. With glass, if you just start the hangout with your glass on, then the only thing you're doing is saying, hey, students, look at the screen now. And you can just watch and ask the kids questions and they can respond. And the entire classroom is watching, you know, the big screen up at the front of the room. And it becomes very easy and natural to share things that are going on. Um, and it was one of my students who said, why aren't we recording that? 
because you're giving us all of the examples of what you think are the best things to see, and if you were recording this, then we could go back and see if what we're working on matches what you think is the best thing. Like, it becomes, and the kid called it, he says it becomes our live rubric. And I thought that was a, a great application for it. Well, and uh, not with glass, but I know Ramsey Musalem, he uses edgy creations. And when he sits down with a student to, to solve a problem, he does it in edgy creations and records his audio right then and then embeds it. He's got an embed uh, code set up already on his website. As soon as he finishes working the problem, he just says to the class, hey, if, any of el if, if others have had problems with this particular problem, go to my website right now and there's, there's a video of, you know, of me solving it with this person. And so, yeah, I could see Glass the same way, you know, now that you've mentioned that, that is a good use yeah. of Glass. Well, because it becomes so simple, like that's the thing I like about Google Glass is it's so simple to start the recording. Um, whether it's video and just, you know, two button presses and you're, you're in unlimited video. And then knowing, you know, you have to get used to how it uploads and when it uploads, but knowing that it eventually gets to your Google+, Plus, it becomes very simple to just hit share. Um, and if you're already flipping your classroom, you're already used to that not every video is perfect moment, so you don't have to do any editing. You just share it and say it is what it is. I found out it's a little bit too easy to share because... <laughs> I was wearing a sock hat today while I was taking some pictures with my Google Glass, and it started, like, doing stuff, and it shared one of the images to some people in my Google Plus account, and I'm like, they're probably wondering, why is he sending me these pictures? Well, that's why I got that. Okay. <laughs> I, just, I just blame my kids. Uh, yeah, that was at Christmas. My niece, I set him down on a table. And I was doing something else, and all of a sudden, a friend of mine texts me and says, what's going on? And she <laughs> sent me this picture, and my niece had video called her and then set the glass down. And so she was just hearing a room full of people and seeing nothing. And she's like, why is he trying to video call me, and this is what's going on? So. That might be the first butt dial with glass. I've <laughs> could be, could be. So I don't know. So, Well, thanks, J.D., for uh, joining us. No problem. Um, and thank you, Joan, for joining us as well. Absolutely. Um, and uh, this has been, a, you know, I think a, a good topic that probably will rejoin sometime down the road um, to get to get more um, get more input on how can we get less homework and how can we have the things that we do have the students at home more valuable. So. Well, you could do what China just did. And they have decreed that elementary schools will no longer give homework. So we could do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks you all again. And uh, for the listeners, I'll talk to you again soon. All right. Stay warm. <laughs>